Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Stefan Zager. I'm an engineer at Google on the Blink rendering team with a focus on layout. And I'm Philip Rogers. I work on the paint and compositing area of the rendering team. OK. We're here to talk to you about Blink rendering and some of the big changes afoot. OK, let's begin with what is rendering. Uh, very simply, it is sort of the bedrock function of a browser. It takes your uh, HTML and CSS, which has been parsed into a DOM tree, and turns it into pixels on the screen. Uh, here I've listed some of the directories in the repository where most of our code lives. Uh, some of it does leak out into other areas like frame and page as well. OK, how does it work? Um, at the bottom, these bubbles, these boxes, indicate the uh, basic document lifecycle. The four bold ones in the middle are the rendering pipeline. And I always think it's helpful to uh, look at a Chrome trace when I'm talking about the document lifecycle. Uh, so what we have here is a Chrome trace of the renderer process. Um, the big section at the top is the main thread, and the little slice at the bottom is uh, just part of the compositor thread. And the way it works is basically this. We start off by um, maybe we are uh, receiving some network or finishing some network requests. We're running script. We're doing things to modify the uh, DOM tree. Uh, we have you know, an idle period there just to do general tasks. And then at some point, vSync happens. Boom. vSync is when the browser has just pushed a full window full of, uh, worth of pixels to the display. And it's time to start generating the next full window of pixels to push to the display. So for the renderer process, this is sort of like an all hands on deck. Everybody get ready. We're going to generate some new uh, pixels. Um, first thing, well, so the, the, the main method to pay attention to, I don't know if you can read that or not, but it's begin main frame. That's sort of the big overarching method that drives uh, the rendering pipeline. The first thing it will do is it will parse uh, sorry, it will uh, handle any pending input events, touches, gestures, keys, um, any scroll events, things like that. It will then proceed to run any uh, request, any pending request animation frame callbacks. Uh, and when it's done with all that and it has modified the DOM to uh, as much as it's going to, it hands it off to the rendering pipeline. Uh, there are four main uh, components. And the first one, style. And uh, at the beginning of style, we take the DOM tree and we use it to construct a tree of layout objects. Uh, lay the layout tree basically drives how we display the DOM. We then do a full walk of the layout tree and annotate each of the nodes with style information for that node. Uh, when style is finished, we take that layout tree, annotate it with style information, we hand it off to, uh, sorry, uh, hand it off to layout in the second stage. In layout, we do another walk of the layout tree and we annotate each object with its position and size. Uh, at the end of layout, with this now twice annotated tree, we hand to the compositing setup stage. Um, compositing setup means we are going to decide how many different graphic buffers we're going to draw into. We're going to determine their size and their locations and their stacking order. Uh, once we have that all done, we proceed to paint. So paint gets the annotated layout tree as well as the compositing setup information. It records uh, what's called a display list of primitive drawing commands, which uh, instruct the compositor how to actually draw the pixels. And at the very end of the paint step, there's a sort of handoff there. Um, paint step will go and create the graphics buffers for the compositing system. Uh, we call them CC layers. Uh, and it will hand these CC layers as well as all of the primitive, uh, the display list of drawing commands off to the compositor running on a separate thread. So the compositor thread is the green area there. Uh, the compositor will take it. It will um, split up all of these graphics buffers into tiles, and it will hand off the tiles to a number of threaded tile workers, which actually go about drawing pixels into the buffers. And at the end, it's handed off to the Chrome compositor, which puts it all on the, dis on the display. And in the meantime, we start all over again. OK, there it is. Um, that was my three-minute explanation, explanation of rendering. Um, one thing to note here that we'll come back to later, main thread is very busy, right? Main thread's where all the action happens. All your scripts runs on the main thread as well as all your rendering and a lot of other, um, a lot of other functionality. So um, main thread is typically congested uh, and uh, a very sort of fruitful avenue for uh, optimization over the years is finding ways we can slice off work from the main thread and throw it onto another thread somewhere. OK, rendering. It's really important, right? Um, 
The first thing I would say is rendering is really like sort of the tip of the spear of anyone's experience of the web platform. Uh, you know, if you reduce the web platform to its most basic, you are taking HTML and CSS, you're turning it into DOM, you're turning DOM into pixels, you're showing it to the user. The user looks at the pixels, the user uh, cre you know, interacts with it, that generates input events, input events trigger the running of script, script modifies the DOM, and then we turn the new DOM into new pixels and show it to the user. So it really is sort of the, um, the, the foremost experience of the web platform. And if rendering is broken, you just, no one has a good time on the web. Uh, it doesn't matter how amazing your weather simulation app is, if we can't render it, uh, users are gonna have a bad time. The second thing I would point out is that uh, we all know about long running JavaScript and its effect on web pages, but next to JavaScript, rendering is by far the hot path in the browser. Um, it is gener generally a CPU bound, uh, deeply recursive code that has to run in just like one big, long, non-interruptible span. So um, it is a big determinant of performance of both actual and perceived. And what I mean by that is, uh, I mean, you can see how much work uh, the main thread is doing rendering here. That is uh, directly tied to like battery life. But uh, additionally, what I mean by perceived performance is because we can't interrupt uh, rendering, um, if rendering runs too long, we just, we skip frames, we jank, the play page gets clunky and is super noticeable to the user. Uh, and that's what I mean by perceived performance. Um, in the old days, you know, most page content was pretty static. Um, we only ran rendering occasionally, but you know, modern web pages are very dynamic. We're animating things, we're changing things, we're loading stuff, we're doing lots of stuff. And that all is reflected in the work that the uh, rendering pipeline does. Uh, okay, oh, and actually I wanted to give an illustrate, illustration of what I mean by the effect of modern web pages. So if you're curious, this trace was taken from a Garrett code review page. Um, it is a small CL, um, and at this time, the content is entirely statically loaded, uh, and all that's happening right now is I'm slowly scrolling down the page, okay? Um, now this is, you can see that rendering is like is doing a lot of work here, but this is generally a well-behaved page. I mean, we have some idle periods during which we can run uh, arbitrary scripts, and we are not uh, missing frames. But let's look at that same Garrett code review page when I am uh, expanding the contents of a file. So off to the left, you can see uh, there's a bunch of JavaScript running that's probably loading re resources and creating all kinds of DOM, new elements, crazy uh, polymer jazz, I don't know. Uh, here's vSync, but the render, rendering process is so busy that it really can't do anything about it. Um, and then eventually, we run the uh, rendering uh, pipeline on the new content, and you can't really tell it because the timeline's not on here, but this is fairly zoomed out. So this is uh, the rendering pipeline running for a pretty long time. Uh, so we're, we're janking frames here, for sure. Um, and this is really like, this is the modern web, right? This is a dynamic page modifying DOM. Okay. So I'm not gonna proceed to talk about uh, some of the big challenges we faced in the rendering code and big projects that we um, are in the process of uh, uh, to, 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 fix, to fix a lot of these issues. And I wanna begin with scrolling. So as I say, um, rendering is a main determinant of perceived performance of the web. Uh, and I would say that scrolling is, is doubly so. Uh, everybody notices when scrolling is bad. When scrolling janks, immediately the user's having a bad experience. So it's a very sensitive area of the code and one that has a very low tolerance for us screwing it up. Um, little history. Uh, the ability to scroll the entire document was present in the very first uh, version of KHTML back in 1998. In 2003, WebKit added the uh, support for overflow scrolling where you could mark any div on the page as, uh, as you know, scrolling its overflow. Uh, and this was added as a sort of separate code path from the document scrolling code. Uh, and at that time, that really wasn't a big deal. I mean, um, it was a very simple render and uh, scrolling was basically consisted of a paint offset. You know, every time someone scrolled one of these items, we would redraw a whole frame of content and just do it at a slightly different offset. So the fact that there were two different code paths for the two different kinds of scrolling was not a big deal. 
but uh, walk forward some time and we added lots of features to scrolling. So uh, composited scrolling and threaded scrolling were uh, performance optimizations and then just like a pile of features that we added. And so the code just got progressively more crazy till it became, I think, one of the most complicated, frustrating and hard to understand uh, subsystems of Blink. And we still had two code paths. So all of these features had to be implemented basically twice. Um, there's other stuff on here, but they, you know, we got to a point where scrolling was just a big tax on uh, doing any kind of development work on Blink that affected scrolling. So things like, um, so scroll animations were hard. Um, even accessibility, which relies on tab order, was hard. Uh, spatial navigation, uh, sticky position objects, all this stuff just was much harder because of the state of the scrolling code and had to be done twice. So our solution was root layer scrolling. Um, in 2014, Steve Kobus and Elliot Sprain had the uh, bright idea to get rid of one uh, code path. So they decided we should get rid of document level scrolls and just use the overflow scrolling path for all scrolling. Um, the primary motivation of this was, again, to uh, reduce the level of crazy in the code base. Um, it was a long, difficult pro project, and in the course of it, we were able to realize many extra benefits. For example, um, because these two code paths had evolved for so long, they had different, behavior, different behaviors. You could actually, there were observable differences in the behavior of uh, document level scrolls versus div scrolls. Uh, they also had uh, completely disjoint sets of bugs. Um, bugs would be filed against one kind of scroll, but not the other. They would be fixed in one kind of scroll, but not the other. So uh, it, was, it was really kind of a mess. Um, the result of this project, uh, project is that we have one scrolling path. They're all affected by the same bugs, but you fix the bug once and it's fixed everywhere. Um, again, it was a lot, you know, we started in 2014. I joined in 2015. Uh, it was a long haul to get this done, but it is shipped in M66, which I believe hit stable yesterday. Um, now, uh, thank you. This is my applause point right here. Thank you. Uh, this is very hard to land. Um, <laughs> right, as you see, this is our test failures graph. Uh, you notice the curious inverse correlation between heat team happiness and layout test failures. So when you try to make a big change to the layout, uh, to the rendering code, the first thing that happens is some n thousand of our about approximately 45,000 layout tests fail. Uh, this starts at 1,500, but in fact, I'm pretty sure that the initial number when we first turned it on was about 6,000 test failures. Every one of those had to be triaged, that had to be understood. Um, a lot of the tests were very old. A lot of the tests were just broken or had bad expectations that were, they, they were just wrong. And we had to dig into every one of these and understand. So we actually fixed a lot of existing bugs along the way. Um, when we turned it on, we saw an immediate performance regression in many, across many axes. Uh, this is a, one example. This is uh, one of our performance benchmarks that is related to hit testing performance. And this is a benchmark where bigger numbers are better. I'll just leave it at that. But uh, you can see when we turned on root layer scrolling, we immediately had a big regression. We had probably 40 or 50 different graphs like this to dig into. Uh, fixing performance bugs in the rendering code is extremely hard. It, like I said, it's a deeply recursive CPU bound hot path code. We have to do uh, CPU profiles and other things that aren't, aren't done that much with other parts of the Chrome, Chromium code. So it's a real slog to fix these things. Uh, and as you can see, it took a, a variety of different code fixes to actually get us back to baseline performance. So, um, and as I say, I just want to sort of reiterate that making changes to scrolling is super delicate because if we mess it up, the users notice immediately and it affects every page. So uh, hard, hard work. Um, Steve Kobus was the originator and was TL throughout. I joined in 2015, and then about six months before the project shipped, we sort of had an all hands on deck. Phil, David, Vlad, and Chris all pitched in. And it's probably running on your device right now. Uh, now I'd like to oh, hand it over to Phil, who's going to tell you about work in the paint and compositing area. All right, like the scrolling code, the paint and compositing code is pretty old. It's grown over the past 16 years, and it's kind of crazy to think that this, this code could drive in the US. Uh, the paint and compositing code, um, 
it's it's tough, and uh, there's some opportunities to make the memory and performance a lot better, and there's some opportunities to make the kind of code health a lot better. It's very difficult to build new features on top of our current code base, and so we kind of have an umbrella project for this called Slimming Paint. Um, Slimming Paint is the, you may have heard this before, you may have heard this name, but you might not know what it is anymore. Uh, I'm gonna try to take a overview, technical overview about what Slimming Paint is, why it's awesome, and where we are in the project today. So I, I think it's useful to start off with an overview about how scrolling works, similar to what Stefan just talked about. In the old days, when we wanted to scroll a div, we would need to repaint it every single frame. So what this means is like, is as the user pulls the scroll bar down, we need to redraw pixels. And it, before the user can move more, they need to wait for us to run that whole rendering pipeline we talked about before. And to fix this, there's a pretty amazing innovation called composited threaded scrolling. And there's two parts to this that are, that are neat. Uh, one is compositing. This is kind of pulling a trick right out of video games. And the idea is that you draw the entire scrollable area into a texture, into an image graphics buffer. Uh, and then instead of redrawing the moving area each frame, you're just doing a copy of a subtexture to a different texture. And the second part of this, so well, let's, let's look, at, look at the simple example really quick. Imagine this is Gmail. Uh, the way this would work is we draw all emails into an image buffer. And then as we're scrolling, we just need to adjust, we, need, we just need to copy a subregion of this image buffer onto the screen every frame. The second innovation here is threading. Uh, the basic idea is that we can do the scroll operation off the main thread. So remember, Stefan talked about how the, the main thread is precious. This is where the user is waiting for us to do something. Or you might have seen the talk uh, from Facebook yesterday where they mentioned how much their th main thread is congested. Uh, the basic idea here is that we can do scrolling while JavaScript is running. Uh, the big in, like these two things together are a pretty amazing innovation. And this idea of composited threaded rendering was generalized to anything that could be represented as a modification to a texture. So, for example, transforms or opacity or CSS animations or transitions or filters or clips. All of these things can be done using this composited threaded concept. And on a, when you're running on software, we're, when we're drawing pixels with the CPU, this is really fast. But on a GPU, it's criminally fast. And so this is a pretty spectacular uh, result, I think. There's been a lot of code over the, the years that have made this like practical. Uh, for example, there's a problem that, that occurs called the layer explosion problem. And this is where, imagine this, so we have three boxes here. Imagine this green box spins on the compositor. Well, if, if it does, it could intersect this blue box. And the problem is that we need to ensure that the blue box draws on top of the green box if this happens. So let's, like here's a dead simple animation. And in order to do this, if we were to make that green box draw with this threaded composited infrastructure, we need to also ensure that the blue box becomes composited. And this leads to a problem because imagine you're a web developer and you make something on your page have opacity. All of a sudden, your memory could just explode because all sorts of other parts of the page need to become composited. Uh, so a lot of careful code was added as we built up this compo compositing infrastructure to solve this problem and to not do it uh, too much. But uh, the median count from our, for our, from our UMA statistics is 20 composite layers per page. And that's after all of our optimizations that we've added over the years. Um, just to give kind of a context for what, what this really means, if you have a new 5K iMac, a full page composited layer is 60 megabytes. And so this adds up over time. This is one of the reasons Gmail uses so much memory. And I'm picking on Gmail here because it's something that, that we focus on a lot. But this applies to Facebook any, any other site, any site that scrolls or has composited things on it, which is pretty much every site. So I want to kind of step through our current compositing infrastructure, like how it works in a, like really simple terms, and then use this to describe how Slimming Paint changes things. So the first step is over here. We have a, uh, we have a DOM tree. In this DOM tree, we have four divs. Uh, we have A, B, a happy face, and D. 
And the happy face can scroll, let's say that. So uh, what we do in our life cycle, it's the same life cycle that Stefan talked about that runs pretty much on every frame, mostly. Uh, so we create what's called layout tree. This just has sizing and position, kind of ordering information in, in it. Um, and so from this example, we had four divs, and it's, we've, we've created them here in this layout tree. Pretty straightforward. Now the compositing setup. This is where we're going to decide what image buffers we're going to create and what their sizes are going to be. And we do this before paint in our current compositing architecture. So let's walk through how it works. We might say that like A, B, and D, they all paint together. They don't scroll. And so we can draw them into a single graphics buffer. So we go ahead and, and size that correctly and create one of these. But we might say that the face, it's scrollable. And so we don't want to draw it every frame. Remember the Gmail example of, of a texture that's, that's moving up and down. We don't want to redraw it every frame. And so what we do is we create a graphics buffer just for that face that's going to scroll. So we've created these, these two graphics buffers. Now we're going to paint them. Now, something that's kind of interesting in our current, the way our system works today is we actually defer painting. So paint on the main thread becomes really a recording of the layout tree in the correct paint order. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk the layout tree, issuing commands. We're going to say, like, draw a text. And then later, Ski is going to actually draw, turn this into pixels. So in this layout tree, we might walk A and issue this text A onto our root graphics buffer. We then do the same for B. But face, it's scrollable. And so we'll put it into its scrolling graphics buffer. And lastly, D, we'll go back into our root graphics buffer. Now we have our kind of recordings into these graphics buffers. We now cross the thread boundary. This is important because the actual drawing of pixels is really expensive. And so it's, it's important to get that off the main thread. Uh, and this is the step, raster is the step where this occurs. This is where we're calling into Skia. When we raster this, all we do is we turn our recorded commands into actual pixels. Finally, when we composite the whole thing together, we just uh, join them onto a page, like draw one on top of the other. And so here's our final results, and maybe this happy face is scrollable in this really simple web page. Maybe if you touch it, it moves up and down or something. So that's, that's like a whirlwind tour of our current, how the main thread renders things. But there are two main issues with this. The first is that compositing is restricted to certain subtrees. Uh, I can't go into a whole lot of detail here. It just takes too long. But this is, there's a property of, of the layout tree that allows us to composite things. And not all subtrees have this. So we cannot arbitrarily turn a div on a web page into an, a graphics buffer. This leads to something called the fundamental compositing bug. This was first discovered in 2014 uh, when we tried to make iframes composited everywhere to, make, to improve scrolling performance. And what happened was we started seeing uh, content paint in the wrong order on Amazon.com. All of a sudden, things were disappearing on the web page. And the reason is that if you make an iframe composited, you need, also need to ensure anything that could ever paint on top of it is also composited. But we can't do this to arbitrary parts of the DOM. And so this led to things painting out of order. This is a devastating bug to find in 2014, because you've built up all this, this special logic to, to not create too many graphics buffers and to handle the threading and all this sort of thing, only to find this late in the game that you have kind of a fundamental bug that ties your hand. And this isn't just tying your hand in, in an edge case that you might be able to hit. This prevents us from building things onto our current architecture. For example, Rob Flack tried to optimize memory on Gmail by making scrolling uh, use fewer image buffers. But it turned out his optimization wouldn't work for the specific case of Gmail because of this problem. So this, this isn't just uh, an edge case bug. This ends up tying our hands for real optimizations. The second issue with our current compositing architecture is that the compositing setup is done before paint. This is where we created those image buffers. We decided to do them very early in the system. We did it on, doing it so early in the system means that we actually have to duplicate a lot of logic in two different ways. Um, for example, the sizing of those image buffers that we created early in the system, you needed to recalculate that in the paint step. So we have, we have duplicate logic, and this is, it's hard to describe how hairy this logic is, but I would say about half of the paint code is for this like sizing and affect uh, what, what things get clipped, these kind of questions, and it's duplicated twice. Uh, in addition, 
doing this compositing setup before paint, there's an issue because it's on the main thread. What this means is that any effect that could change the size of painted things needs to go back to the main thread. This, this is not great. Like, for example, if you have, um, if, if you think about the size, like what, let me phrase this this way. You have to assume the worst case in many scenarios. If you have two boxes that, that could be composited and one of them scrolls, you have to assume that the compositor could scroll anywhere on the page. And so you have to create image buffers for many things on the page. This is kind of the layer explosion problem we talked about before. And so this leads to really suboptimal decisions. We use way too much memory. But it's on the main thread. We have to assume the worst case. So slimming paint changes just two things in our entire architecture. It changes the granularity of, of how we can choose to composite things. And it does this so that you can composite, you can turn any effect into an image buffer. And the second is that we move the compositing setup to after paint. So just two, two changes here. I think the second part needs a little bit more explanation. Uh, in our current setup, we've kind of walked through this. Stefan showed it as well. You do the compositing setup, you then paint, then you cross the thread boundary, finally you raster. In our new architecture, you paint, you then cross the thread boundary, then you decide your compositing layers, then you raster. So we move this work off the main thread, we can make much better decisions, and we can fix uh, the fundamental compositing bug as well. So let's walk through the same really simple example in Slimming Paint. Again, we parse the page just the same as before. And we have four divs, and we create a layout tree with four elements. From this, we walk the layout tree to paint. And again, we're just recording commands. We're not actually drawing pixels quite at this stage. In this, what we do is we do a linear walk of the layout tree, assuming there are no layers. Uh, but what's kind of special here is that we break it up into chunks. So a linear walk of the layout tree produces a, a linear display item list. But you can segment this list in different ways. And we've chosen to segment at any time a non-local effect changes, such as scrolling or opacity or transforms. And so when we're walking this layout tree, we have A, B, face, and D. We might say, OK, we have text A. Let's record a command for text A. Text B, draws just like A. Let's create a command for that. But then the face, it's scrollable. So that's something different. So let's, let's segment this linear display item list into multiple groups. So we have a second group for face. But now we're no longer scrollable when we hit D. And so let's again segment it again. So we've, we've walked, we have a linear list, but we just cut it up into what we call paint chunks. We then pass these chunks across the thread boundary and do a compositing setup here. Just like I said before, this is no longer on the main thread. So we've, we've moved a large chunk of work off the main thread. Uh, what we do here is we might decide that uh, the chunk one and chunk three should draw together into an image buffer. We might say that the face should draw into a different image buffer. Lastly, we take this and we raster it. This is where we draw, we actually fill in the pixels. This is the same stuff as before. We take these pixels and we splat them together into our final result. So the new compositing architecture, it can composite it at any effect boundary. And we've moved the compositing setup after, after paint, which frees up the main thread. Uh, this allows us to make exact compositing decisions about what things overlap. This allows us to do things that change the size of painted objects off the main thread. For example, you can change clip paths in this design off the main thread, because when you change the size of something, you just rerun the compositing setup on your compositor thread. So that's Slimming Paint. That's like a whirlwind tour of what Slimming Paint is. Uh, if you've heard of this project before, you might have seen our milestones, Slimming Paint v1, v1.5, v1.75, and v2. And I think all you can really get from this is that we're getting asymptotically closer to Slimming Paint v2. With like the benefit of hindsight, I would give these different names. I would say that uh, Slimming Paint v1 was just the cache paint project. And Slimming Paint v2 is compositing after paint. Uh, there's kind of a funny story. I don't know if you all know that our About Flags page gets translated. But at some point, uh, I had a Russian translator coming to me saying, like, what is, is it Slimming Paint invalidation or Slimming Paint invalidation? And what is Slimming Paint or invalidation in Russian? And so to, to engineers, I don't think it means much more than that. So I hope these, these names might give a better description about what's really happening here. Uh, where are we in this, in this design? Uh, we just shipped, or we're shipping in the next release of Chrome, Simming Paint v175. I'll talk about that in just a minute. 
But I think this year we're going to do Slimming Paint V2, which moves compositing setup after paint. So Slimming Paint 175, uh, this, this is launching in the next release of Chrome. The big idea here is just to do an incremental launch, launch as much of Slimming Paint as we can without changing the order of the compositing setup. Uh, so this is really a de-risking of the Slimming Paint V2 project. Uh, there weren't major user visible changes here. Uh, we were able to fix a top star bug because our code is slightly cleaner. Uh, and we were able to do raster invalidation slightly less. But the main idea here is just to launch almost all of Slimming Paint V2 without changing the order of the compositing setup. Uh, these are the folks that worked on Slimming Paint 175. I like to call out Xian Zhu, who did the bulk of the work here, and Tian Ren, who came up with this idea of this incremental launch point that allowed us to ship more code uh, faster. And Chris and myself did some work too. That's, that's it. Let's talk about layout. That's OK, so uh, we talked about scrolling, we a project that has shipped. Uh, we talked about paint compositing, a project that is uh, very far along. And now let's talk about uh, a project in layout, which is really in its earliest stages. OK, there are two primary problems with layout. And the first one I would describe as more of a web platform problem, and we call it the combinatorial problem. It is basically, we have tons of web standards. We keep adding more, and we don't get rid of the old ones. And what, uh, every time we define a new CSS standard, uh, it creates a new set of interactions with all the existing CSS standards. They combine in weird ways. It creates corner cases and edge cases uh, that are really fun to untangle. Everybody has sort of has a favorite um, example of this. I'm going to walk through one that's sort of near and dear to my heart. OK. Here is a flex box with three flex items, one, two, and three. Here is that same flex box if we make it instead of uh, left to right text, we're going to make it right to left. Who knew that uh, text direction affected flex layout? I didn't. Uh, well, so now let's make it flex direction row reverse. OK, now we're back to 1, 2, 3. Take away RTL and we're at 3, 2, 1. Here's a column flex box. Here's a column reverse flex box. Now it gets a little more fun. Here's a uh, row flex box with writing mode vertical LR. Row reverse vertical LR. Here's a column flex box, writing mode vertical LR. I think I can stop here, but just for yucks, I put the entire grid up. This is every uh, combination of writing mode, direction, and flex direction. And I added in scroll bars just for fun, because scrolling is a theme, I guess, today. Uh, this is Chromium. You'll notice, if you look closely enough, that everything pretty much renders correctly. And the reason that it renders correctly is because I spent about three weeks of my time rooting out bugs in all of this. Um, and now, uh, let's take a look at what other browser number one does. It's mostly correct. There's some bugs in there, for sure. Uh, how about other browser number two? And how about other browser number three? OK. <laughs> So I'm not, uh, I'm not doing this to engage in, in browser shaming. Uh, if you picked a different set of features, uh, Chromium would show badly, and the other browsers would show better. Uh, I simply mean to reinforce the point that you know we, we have this problem. I mean, it's a compatibility problem for sure, right? And um, to keep piling complex CSS features, I mean, we want to keep being able to do interesting things. I mean, we add Flexbox and Grid Layout and all these things, but to keep piling new features that have to be supported uh, in all the browsers on top of this is, is madness. Uh, OK. The second big problem is with the layout code in Blink. Um, this is very old code. And as I say, a lot of it dates to, back to KHTML. I heard a term recently, which I really liked, which is uh, crispy noodle code, which is tangled up like spaghetti code, but every time you touch it, it breaks. That is, I think, a good description of our uh, layout code. And in particular, it is monolithic, non-encapsulated, non-reentrant, non-thread safe. That's a lot of buzzword soup, so let's be really explicit about what we mean here. Here's a layout tree. The nodes are layout objects. And uh, let's say that we change CSS on an element way down in the tree. That tree, that element's now dirty, and it needs to be relayed out. Um, the next thing we do is mark the entire ancestor chain of that object as dirty. And when we want to run layout, we always, always, always start at the top of the tree and work our way down. 
Now we have a bunch of optimizations, which mean that we don't have, we, uh, we skip a lot of work on the way down, but still, we have to do a complete tree walk, and it's not free every time we want to lay something out. Now this thing at the bottom may be in a fixed size box. Uh, it may even use CSS containment, which is a new feature, which is sort of a contract with the browser saying, this subtree will not affect anything outside of itself, and nothing outside of the subtree can affect its layout. Still, we have to do a complete layout tree walk. Okay, second, non-encapsulated. Uh, let's say that we, are, uh, we wanna lay out this subtree. It would be nice, we would really like it, if we could say that when we go to lay out this subtree, we have all of the information that we need to lay out this subtree, and we don't need to look outside of this subtree for any additional information to determine size and position. But that's not true. We look outside of the subtree all the time, uh, running the layout code to get uh, other information. Uh, and, okay, non-reentrant. Okay, let's say we're doing a tree walk to determine layout. We've made it this far, we're at this node, and let's say, for some reason, we would really like to skip to a different part of the tree. We cannot. That's completely broken, you can't do that. That will break everything. Uh, and what's even more horrible, we actually do do that in a couple of places. And uh, enough said. Uh, and then thread safe. Uh, so when we when I explained the rendering pipeline before, you saw uh, we talked, talked about how we took a layout tree, we annotated it with style, we re-annotated it with layout information, we handed it off to paint. When we're done with all that, we're ready to generate the, ne the next frame of content. We begin with the same layout tree that we had from the last time. We update it for any DOM that has changed and then we walk through it and re-annotate it with new styles, new position, new layout. Uh, there's nothing remotely thread safe about that. You could not possibly have multiple threads uh, modifying that and just to, not to put too fine a point on it, but there are plenty of places where we have global state in the, low, in the, in the layout code. Okay, so two problems, two fixes. The fix for the combinatorial problem is CSS custom layout, also known as Houdini. Uh, what this means is uh, you can set a certain CSS property on an element, and then you will define a JavaScript function which is responsible for laying out that element and its subtree. Um, during the regular layout process, we will sort of pause. We will call into your uh, JavaScript function. Uh, we will give it a set of information, which we call the constraint set, which should be all the information you need to lay out your element, and then your JavaScript takes it away. I won't go into too much more detail about that. Uh, Ian Kilpatrick will be giving a talk on this uh, later today. He's the tallest guy not named Dominic or Philip. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, and then uh, the solution to the second problem is, to the, to the um, crispy noodle problem is layout ng. And it really is sort of a root and branch rethink of how we do uh, layout entirely. Um, so there are two primary uh, properties of layout ng. One is that it uses constraint-driven layout, also known as encapsulation. What that means is when we enter a subtree to do its layout, we pass it all of the information that it will need to lay out itself and its subtree, and it, it does not look outside of that subtree at all. And if you think about it, the way I describe layout ng, there's some, um, it dovetails, right? Uh, when we want to call into your JavaScript code, we're actually gonna call into a JavaScript context where you're not allowed to look outside of your subtree and you must be past a full set of constraints that will uh, allow you to, to, to lay out your code in your JavaScript. Uh, we're trying to implement a uh, custom layout in a, an underlying layout system which is not encapsulated is also madness. So by uh, enforcing encapsulation in the underlying uh, layout code, we make it much easier to implement CSS custom layout. And then the second thing is that uh, rather than taking one layout tree and re-annotating it and re-annotating it and handing it back again, we create a fresh layout tree every time. And once we create it, that tree is immutable. Now, it, we can make a copy of it and alter a subtree with a new, you know, replace uh, subtrees and we'll have a whole new copy of the layout tree. But an entire layout tree is an immutable object. Um, and we have also separated the inputs from the outputs. So in the existing co code, the layout tree is both the input and the output. It's just that we uh, annotate all the nodes in the tree with size and position information. 
In the new system, we're going to have something called a fragment tree. And the fragment tree is now the output of the layout system. It is the only thing that the paint code will need to then proceed with the paint steps. Uh, and the fragment tree will also be immutable. So these properties potentially unlock crazy magical rainbow unicorn optimizations in the layout code. For example, uh, if uh, layout is constraint driven and you want to lay out a subtree and that subtree is CSS contained, maybe it's not necessary to stop to start at the very top of the layout tree. Maybe we jump down and do that. Um, if we're running a layout and we, on a subtree and we can determine that we have already run layout on that or an identical subtree with the identical set of constraints, well, we're going to be caching. We're going to have a fragment cache for some of these outputs, and maybe we can just reuse one of those fragment caches and not have to run layout on that object again. Um, there are also more sort of like science fiction-y things, like maybe we want to do threaded layout. Maybe we want to run th layout itself on a thread. Maybe we want to do speculative layout before vsync, because we think we can get a jump on the next frame. Um, maybe because the output of layout is now immutable and, there, and so should be thread safe, maybe we want to take all of paint and evict it from the main thread and do all of the drawing stuff on the compositor thread. Uh, they're just, there's sort of a big magical box of, of things we can do uh, with the new layout code that we're very excited about. So again, this project's in the very early stages. None of it has shipped yet. Uh, the first phase is most of block flow layout, including inlines. Um, that is scheduled to ship sort of around the end of this year. The subs we're not going to, we're hopefully not going to go down the slimming paint uh, dead end of naming. We're going to have a phase two and probably a phase three. Phase two will be some of the sort of weird edge cases like editing, um, uh, pagination, and multi-column. And then phase four will be other things that are not block flow, like flex and grid. And in all likelihood, there will be a phase four, or five, and six, maybe a seven. Uh, yeah, that's about all I want to say about that. So um, again, Ian's here. You can also send uh, inquiries to layout dev. And that's it. I want to just wrap it up a little. Um, rendering, it's a big deal, right? Uh, again, I want to emphasize, in a modern dynamic web, the user experience is really only as good as the rendering. Um, if we can't render a page, all the rest of your magic uh, is wasted. Um, but uh, and we, you know, we have this very old code that was architected for a very different web. Uh, but we are, we're changing it. We're making big sort of foundational changes in the way we render pages in Blink, and we see a bright future for this code going forward. So stay tuned. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes if you guys have any questions. <laughs> That's a long session, so if you guys want to take a break, I understand. OK. Thank you. Uh, one quick oh, question. Uh, sorry, question. Sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, this might be a little bit of a naive question, but um, so the, how much has the introduction of Shadow DOM uh, broken assumptions on the old code base? Um, is it something really radical as far as the infrastructure goes, or is it just fitting nicely into it and it's only a few tweaks here and there? So I would say, interestingly, um, the integration of Shadow DOM into the rendering code has not been as painful as you might expect. It, is, it can be difficult when you're trying to make a mental model of how the layout tree maps back to the DOM tree uh, with Shadow DOM. But once we're entering the pure layout world, um, the, the objects all pretty much function the same. Yeah. Anybody else? OK. Thank you. <laughs>